Hello and welcome um, to the second day of this year's summer school Security of Things. My name is Simeon Wiedemann and I have the pleasure to start the second day with you. Uh, we will start with a little presentation and after the presentation I would like to get involved with you in a discussion, hopefully fruitful to all of us. And the topic for today, for the first talk, will be revising some security, uh, computer security basics, the first part of a, a two-part talk. The second part will be given by our professor Clemens Chapp later on in today. It will be an easy introduction and uh, yeah, focusing on risks and protection goals. At first, uh, a few words to the person talking here. As I mentioned, my name is Simeon Wiedemann. I am a security researcher at the Institute of Computer Science uh, here in, at University of Rostock uh, at the Chair of Information and Communication Services. I did my studies at University of Rostock in Information Technology and Technical Computer Science, Bachelor's and Master's, and as well for one semester I was studying at the University of Oviedo, Spain in Master of Web Engineering. Before I was uh, joining the research team uh, around Professor Chapp. I was a software developer and if I'm not working, uh, part of my free time activities is I'm uh, an enthusiast uh, about open, uh, open source, open uh, licenses like Creative Commons. I use Signal instead of WhatsApp and if there's any time off the computer then I'm probably playing kayak polo uh, or I'm listening to Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. That being said, so that you know who is talking and you have a little context. Okay, today we will talk about uh, what it is that uh, is a part of uh, what, what, what communication is and how computer systems do communicate. As the title mentioned, uh, we will spend a great deal of time in this talk paying attention to what IT security means um, and I hope to motivate you why this is an important topic to each and every one of us so why we should care about it and at the end of the talk we'll have a very brief glimpse on some basic strategies to achieve IT security there will be much more to that part in the, in the second part of the talk given by Professor Chap after the break today Okay, we'll start up with uh, what it is uh, that we call communication. And uh, I already mentioned I like free resources, so the first thing I do is I look up Wikipedia, and there you can find that communication is the act of conveying meanings from one entity or group to another through the use of signs, symbols, and rules. And originally it comes from the Latin communicare, which means to share. And when we share information, the, what happens is we trigger associations and ideas grow. Of course, the first thought that pops into the mind, or at least in my mind, when I think about communication is people talking with other people. But the definition you can find on the slide, um, I added a, this, this picture of the lighthouse, because it was helpful for me to, to, to think of the part that I take for granted in a normal day communication, talking to other people. Um, sometimes I forget that there's signs and symbols that are actually part of the communication. And the lighthouse, for example, is a good, uh, is a good picture to transport the meaning of <coughs> a lighthouse, symbols, some ships in the night, that there is land so that they don't crash into the land. And therefore, a lighthouse is uh, one example of communication. And you already see that communication is not one single thing, but it may even look totally different. Of course, when we communicate with our friends, it looks more like this. We take our phones in, in our hands, our smartphones, they have all sorts of messages. We talk to each other on the phone, we, we flick each other texts, we send each other pictures, we send each other movies, voice recordings, all sorts of things, or even GPS trackings where we are. But, um, of course, this is just yet one other view of communication. It might even look like this when we think of insides of computers. 
then we don't really see much of the communication, but we see lots of cables and, and technical items and stuff. But there's actually communication happening, a great deal of communication, of course. Um, another view uh, on communication is, of course, before communication happens, we need some motivation, or there's, there's, there's a motivation why communication should happen. And um, once there is this motivation, uh, an entity, a person, a machine, one part of a communication will compose a message. And this is basically to think about uh, what you want to, to transport and, and what, what, you, what information you want to exchange and share. And that information then needs an encoding, which is the message encoding. Um, for example, put the thoughts into words, words and share these words with other people that you hang around with. And then, of course, there's the transmission of the information of the message, which happens via a medium. In speech, we ap apparently uh, we uh, trigger some fluctuations in the, in the air pressure that reaches uh, other people's ears. But this is only one version of transmission. There's other transmissions. You know, for example, your phone or computer uses broadcast transmissions on, on Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Of course, there's cable connections which transport uh, voltage uh, fluctuations, all sorts of things. Um, yeah, the transmission is not free of some impact from the outside, which is uh, what we call noise. And uh, we transmit the message to the other part of our communication, to the other entity, which is uh, first considered with re receiving the, the message. And the message now contains the noise, as I mentioned. Um, the next step on the receiving end is, of course, uh, to decode the message. Uh, for example, to uh, make sense of the fluctuations in air pressure, to turn them into the understanding of words. And the understanding already goes towards the interpretation. Uh, if um, you say some words, I hear the words, maybe I don't know what they're meaning. You can uh, think of this like you're in a foreign, foreign country and um, somebody's talking to you but you don't understand the meaning, then the interpretation part is uh, what is difficult for you. To get an everyday example for, for this uh, process, I thought it might be helpful to look at a traffic light example. Each and every one of us probably has some daily life experiences with traffic lights. Of course, there is a motivation for traffic lights. If you are in a car, you come to an intersection and there is a red light, the motivation for the traffic light that is about to communicate with you as a driver is, of, uh, of course, to avoid accidents and bring order into the street regulations. Um, we have a message that we want to composite. For example, do not drive on. And this message will be encoded, for example, with color, red color in a traffic light, or with a position. Then uh, in, in Europe and Germany, for example, the traffic lights have their red color on top. And also there's a sequence. Uh, usually there's a red color on top in Europe, Germany, that's, that shows on, that's shown. And uh, there's yellow in the middle, and green is on the bottom and the traffic light either switches from red to yellow to green or from green to yellow to red and the, the sequence already gives you information in which direction the traffic light uh, the, the traffic light yeah is uh, about to change its, its its status the transmission in that uh, in that example would be sending out light from the light bulb in the traffic light or the led or whatever technology is used and the, the light is uh, transmitted, of course, through the air and uh, eventually reaches uh, the eye of the driver. There is a noise, of course. Uh, imagine a sunny day when uh, uh, the traffic light is right next to the sun and you as a driver can barely see the traffic light because the sun is shining brightly into your eyes directly. Then the, re the recipient, you as a driver, for example, you have to do uh, some work to focus on the traffic light. Example, for example, you filter out the sunlight as much as you can. You glimpse your eyes or you shake your head and uh, you to try to detect the light that is shining up. Of course, in this case,
case it is helpful that you have more than just one meaning that you have the position. Uh, apparently the top position is lightening up, so even if you cannot really see the color, you, sh you surely know it's still the red light on top. Which is already decoding, the red light, the top light is turned on after the green one, which means um, you, you could make sense of the light signal and as you have some knowledge from your driver's school, uh, during the interpretation, you know that you should stop the car. Okay, uh, this is an analog s situation for communication, but I found it helpful uh, to, uh, to get a look into the parts of communication, because once it's getting technical, more technical, uh, the, the individual parts quickly turn out to be their own specific areas of, of, of research, of expertise, and uh, it's I hope this makes clear that communication is not just one single thing, but it's a, a, a follow-up of, of individual steps in one direction and sort of the reverse into the other direction. Okay, but we are here in the computer science department and in the security of interconnected things, of course, we would like to do something with computers. And computers are communication systems. Um, I already showed you this... Uh, this uh, uh, gave you this idea of the, the computer is communicating, so communication may look even uh, chaotic to us, but it doesn't mean uh, that the communication taking place doesn't have any great sense. Okay, computers as communication systems. What do they look like? Where can we find them? And how do they operate? And what, who are they communicating with? This, this is what we'll look uh, into for now. When I think of Computers as communication systems, the first thing that pops into my mind is classical networks like computer pool, uh, probably the internet, some computers connected to some servers, which are essentially only other computers, even a little bit more powerful, maybe remotely. Of course, your smartphone is already a very sophisticated computer by now, and this is only one impression of computers as communication systems. Um, it, it's not always the case that they look that obviously like computers, even though there's computers communicating. Here's some other examples where computers as communication systems might be hidden. On, on the left side you see the, a picture of the computer science department building, the Konrad Zusa House here at University of Rostock, where we are currently recording uh, and where we are taking place from during the summer school. Uh, in the middle you see a modern car. The picture is taken from a news uh, article about uh, uh, hacking a car. Of course, because there were computers inside the car that did a lot of communication. And the right picture is uh, from a newspaper article about Stuxnet, which you may know for its being famous as a first real sophisticated cyber attack against uh, states. And you see the leadership of, uh, of Iran inside uh, the uh, nuclear power plant, which was a uh, target of attack, of a computer uh, attack, of, on a, uh, of an attack against computers, which are essentially communication systems in that case. Of course, they might be hidden, but um, you may say, where are the computers here? Uh, just because we don't see them doesn't mean they aren't there. So um, this is where the computers in this case might be hidden. On the left side again, there's some pictures from the inside of the Konrad Zuse building of the computer science department. You see a motion detection in the top left part of the left picture. You see lightning, ventilation and shutters on the window in the top right part or the control panel for the human interaction with the, with the communication system that is integrated into the building. And there's heating regulations, for example. These are all devices, sensor actuators, that are um, turning this building into a modern building and also into a communication system that has lots of, lots, lots of computational power uh, distributed uh, where computers essentially take communication. The center part shows you uh, a model of a car with lots of wires and, and electrical stuff inside and the computers inside. And there are so many embedded systems in a modern car. For example, you have the entertainment system 
Of course, you have braking systems, rescue systems like airbags, all sorts of systems, convenience systems that are more and more digital, more and more computers used in there. And of course, the computers they are in, in the car, they communicate. So they are a communication, they are part of a communication system. And on the right side, you see a programmable logical controller, in this case, a Siemens logo, which uh, is, for example, used in industrial plants or on factories um, to control uh, automating processes. Uh, yeah. Which um, is uh, also it's, it's a similar device to the, the device that has been target of the attack for Stuxnet. Of course, they can even look totally different uh, in, in a power plant, for example, or in any, any other factory. There may be rooms full of computers, which are essentially the communication systems, showing all the information of what temperature does a special part of the product line have, what, what's the pressure, a monitoring situation, but also a controlling situation. And there are the computers on the left side, of course. You see lots of screens, which, which remember you, uh, they, they look probably familiar to you as computers. But on the top right, you see again a programmable logical controller. Um, and this is essentially a computational device that does not look like what we know as a computer. But it's also used to, to process uh, communication with devices. We use these kind of communication systems because we think, or we don't even think, but there are benefits of it. But they don't come along uh, without risks. Benefits would be, for example, we can uh, higher the productivity, or we can increase the comfort, or can lower the expenses of, uh, for example, a factory or even a building. You, for example, with a communication system inside a modern building, you can turn off all the lights at once. So in the evening, when everybody is gone in the university's computer science department, there's nobody needing to run around the building switching off all the lights, but you just trigger them. You can even trigger them remotely. Of course, this can lower the energy turnover of a building like that. It uh, increases the maintainability, and you have more and more control about it and what you do. Um, yeah, When computers communicate, they make use of communication protocols. And here you see a light switch, you've, you've seen before, it's part of the KNX installation in our Konrad Zuse computer science department. And that, 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 light, that light switch is uh, taking part in the communication now. And uh, it's the who of the communication, because we have uh, to answer the questions like who is saying what to whom. And of course, a light switch is used to turn on lights, so it sends a telegram says, turn on lights. But who is the telegram sent to? Of course, we need some, some light, uh, lightning source that we can trigger with the telegram. And the com communication that uh, takes place with, with computers, making uh, use of communication protocols. The protocols define some things, some basic things like identification, who, for example, the source address in a computer, in, in, in a network, the, the, the light switch may have an address, a source address, and that is, uh, is used to identify the light switch. And this light switch then says something, the information, for example, the command or measuring value could be encrypted, could be authenticated, but there is some information that is sent. And where is it sent to? For example, the, the light source that has a destination address that is mentioned in the telegram. And um, there's more to it what the uh, uh, communication protocol defines. For example, when does the light switch uh, access the communication media? Or how is it technically realized? Which media are we, are we using? Which characteristics are there technically? Are we sending on, on a cable? Are we broadcasting wireless? Or is there multiple devices, for example, connected in the network? Um, yeah, the, the amount of data that we can send, for example, can be defined by the protocol. So the protocol is basically the manual for the communication, and the computers stick to it, and therefore can deterministically communicate, hopefully. That's the idea. OK, in this example, the light switch and the light source are not traditionally wired up with just a copper wire, but they are part of a communication system because they are 
they are smart devices, they have computing power and uh, they are sending telegrams and which, which has some benefits. For example, other light switches may even be able to turn on the same light. So they form a network and um, in, that, in that network they communicate with each other. The technology used in that case is KNX, which is one example of a field bus. And um, field buses are pretty much one example of a communication system uh, involving computers. They interconnect sensors and actuators with each other, for example, buttons and switches. And, and now we can talk to smart lights and fans and shutters. Smart, as I mentioned, because they process computational, they process computational power. There's some, some calculations going on. It's not merely sending electricity to the device, but it's sending telegrams that tell the device what to do, and the telegram will interpret that, tele that uh, the, the target device will interpret that uh, telegram and then behave on it. And these devices, for example, they talk via a field bus, like for example, Kinex, where many, many devices can be interconnected together. On, an, on a less abstract, more detailed uh, view, this may look like this. Um, you see, uh, this is KNX again. Um, you have a backbone line which connects multiple areas, the gray, the gray boxes, um, which uh, you can see here. And uh, there's one area and there's another area, for example. And there's, there's the backbone couplers, BCs, that uh, couple together multiple areas. And one area can contain multiple lines, which is the light gray, area, light gray boxes here. And the lines, again, have a line coupler connecting them to the main line. And on one line, there can be multiple devices. And the devices, of course, we saw m some of them. It can be emotion detection devices, it can be lightning sources, ventilations, shutters, control panels, heating regulations, all sorts of things. And in this case, you can see that there can, man can be multiple devices on one communication media. For example, a twisted pair cable. And they can all talk to each other and to devices in other areas. Using making use of, of the couplers that you can see here. And of course, since there are many participants in one area, in one line per area, it's a little bit like in a school class where there are many kids and if they would all talk at the same time, nobody would understand nothing. And this is why they make use of protocols, for example, to determine who is allowed to talk and what's going to happen when there is some problems, for example, people cross-talk or intercept each other. Okay, uh, one question I had in the slides about the computers as communication systems was who are they talking to? And one easy way to classify this is computers can talk to computers or more generally machines can talk to machines and they do this based on standards, standardized interfaces. Why? Because otherwise everything would be super complicated and each and every machine would have to learn all of the other languages of all the other machines and of course machines are not uh, that kind of dynamic learners and even you probably do not speak all the languages other humans speak. So based on standardized interfaces different people can come up with machines that uh, fulfill the standardized, inter standardized interfaces and then are capable of talking to other machines. This is especially powerful because we can focus on the, on the capabilities of machines and in some parts machines are better than humans. They can do repetitive tasks much faster and more enduring than we are able of, of doing. Um, but of course machines can also talk to humans and the, this is the so-called machine-to-human communication where we need other interfaces, less technical ones, mm, some that connect the technical background of the computational machine part to the, to the human user. And um, we are used to, used to use keyboards and mouses, and then there came the touch phones along, so we started to use touch. Now there's voice assistance where we 
control, for example, Alexa with our voice commands. These are all examples for, for human, uh, human interfaces because humans want to interact with the machines, so they somehow have to communicate with the machine. And the machine does not, of course, internally understand English or German or any other language uh, that, that the humans uh, usually speak, but the machines work on their own languages. Luckily, by now, we have all sorts of uh, ideas and technology that can mix it up and we as humans are capable of building machines which we can interact with by communicating. And here, the focus is more, or should be hopefully, on the human needs and skills. Because if the machine that you as a human would like to communicate with would require you to talk binary to the machine, then you would probably not enjoy communicating with that machine much, so you wouldn't use the machine very often. And then where's the point in building it? Okay, hopefully this answered the questions that uh, I posed for, proposed for, for earlier. We do not have a single answer to what do they look like, because they can come in all sorts of shapes and even hidden, and we can find them almost everywhere in private buildings, in public buildings, in factories, in vehicles, planes, ships. Even inside bodies, there's some, for example, pacemakers that are uh, communication devices. Even in orbit, we have International Space Station machinery that we talk to. We send satellites far away and still trying to communicate to, uh, to them. Of course, it takes, it takes a lot of time because the information has to travel a huge distance, but um, that being said, it's easy. It's not. E it's neither. It is easy to to answer the question where do we find them because you can find them wherever you want to find them, pretty much. Um, how do they operate? I, I scratch a little bit the surface on how they operate by by showing you that there's, for example, field buses that interconnect sensors and sensors and actuators via a communication medium and then they interact they, they interact by exchanging standardized uh, default uh, standardized uh, packages telegrams for example um, making use of protocols that determine who is allowed to speak and when and where and what and how does a message have to look like and of course machines talk to machines but they can also interact kind of communicate with humans okay Coming to the security part, which uh, should be the focus of the talk for now. Um, IT security. It's a buzzword. Not as much as cyber security, but essentially IT security, computer system security, computer security, cyber security, all these kinds of words are frequently used and I find that they are not as frequently understood very well. So I try to help uh, give a little bit an overview of what people may think or may may mean when they use these kind of words. Um, there is a difference between safety and security. So safety is wearing a helmet when you're on a construction site. Or safety is when somebody thinks of how do I construct a chainsaw in, in a way that uh, when people use it they don't lose their fingers. Security, what we would focus on, is uh, if your neighbor cannot control your heating and lighting system by connecting to your house and making use of your system when he's not supposed to. And again, to understand what is information security, what is IT security, what is infosec, what is cyber security, my first attempt is looking up what, is info, what, what information is freely available in the worldwide knowledge base Wikipedia. And there we can find that the properties of information processing and storing systems, for example computers, that ensure the protection goals of confidentiality, confidentiality availability and inte integrity are what we consider information security. Of course, this serves to protect against dangerous, uh, uh, dangers or threats and to avoid damage and to, to minimize risks. The protection goals, as they are called, confidentiality, availability and integrity are also sometimes referred to as the CIA right? which is not about the Secret Service, it's just about the main goals of uh, IT security. And 
since they are not self-explaining in total, we'll have a look at them now. Confidentiality, for example, is the property that information is not made available or disclosed to unauthorized individuals, entities or processes. It may be similar to privacy, but it's, it's not exactly that. It's, it's more like confidenti confidentiality allows privacy. Think about uh, you're working in, in a business and then you come up with a fancy new idea that makes your, products, uh, your company's product even more efficient than, than other uh, companies in, in your field, for example and you'd like to send that email uh, explaining your idea to your supervisor. Uh, you really would like to be sure that the other person in that communication is your supervisor and not some other company. Uh, this is one example where confidentiality may, may be helpful. Um, I took the liberty of trying to explain it on, on our KineX system, which is a system that we will come along quite frequently during the summer school. So imagine there is uh, the, the light switch again and the, the lamp. And now the light switch wants to communicate with the lamp and tell him, telling the lamp, turn on. Of course, the lamp needs to understand that because that's, that's the intention of the communication. The, the, the user toggling the switch and then the switch wants, essentially wants the light to turn on by sending the light a telegram that tells it to turn on. But it would be a situation where maybe somebody that is eavesdropping on, on the communication medium is not supposed to know that the light is turned on. The light seems a very unimportant example here, but imagine this would not control a light, but control a heating, and then imagine it would not control the heating of your personal room, but of a factory producing aluminium, for example, where the heating course may be some secrets that greatly independ your financial situation of your company and a concurrent company would love to know when you will heat up the system and when you will cool down the system. So suddenly this kind of information become more, more worse to protect and then you again would like to have the confidentiality in this kind of communication. So, as I depicted here, somebody that is eavesdropping should probably not be capable of understanding what has been said, therefore the gibberish instead of the lights on. Okay, another protection goal I mentioned in the definition of IT security was integrity. Integrity, again from Wikipedia, is the maintaining and assuring the accuracy and completeness of data over its entire life cycle. It's also sometimes referred to as data integrity. And this means that there is no unauthorized or undetected data modification. Unauthorized means, of course, somebody is authorized, is, is allowed to alter the data. For example, the switch is allowed to alter the data on the communication medium because it wants to, to create a telegram that is sent via the, the bus to turn on the light. But there's, for example, an attacker Who's not, who should not be allowed to, to do the same. Or if there's something going on that's altering the data, then at least we'd like to detect it so that we know that this data has been altered. Imagine you would uh, have a speedometer that shows that you're 30 miles per hour when you're actually 50 miles per hour. It's probably not a good idea if the system is, uh, is easily fooled to show 30 miles per hour when you actually go 50 miles per hour because then you would probably not react in a situation uh, where, where you need to break. It, it's, it's harder to break and you, uh, you assume, assume that you will be capable of breaking when you're actually not as quickly capable of breaking as you would need to. Or another example, if you have a factory monitored and the temperature data that is on your monitor is altered and the displayed temperature is 10 degrees less than the actual temperature, then maybe uh, the entire power plant goes off because there's a reaction triggered because the monitoring station thinks everything is fine, they are rising the temperature, when in, indeed the temperature originally uh, measured is, is, is higher. So the communication system that, measure, that, that sends the measured temperature to the control room 
should of course uh, be a communication medium where integrity should be guaranteed. Um, yeah, again our KNX example, if the, if the light switch sends the package lines on, this should also reach the, um, the, the lamp as the package light on and should stay like this the entire way through. And what, not sh what, what shouldn't be possible is that somehow, for whatever reason, this would be, uh, for example, lights off. Unless, of course, the original or the authorized uh, switch sent that telegram, but it did not. It sent the light on package. So the light on package should be reached and the light off package should not be reaching. Uh, it shouldn't happen, but once it happens, it should not be accepted by the lamp, for example because something has happened, the, the message is not integral. Okay, and then there was, uh, there was another protection goal called availability. And this is, I think this is the most intuitive of all. If we come up with a, with a system that, that we want to use, um, then we want to use it. And if there's some parts of the system that are not available, then we cannot use it. So the functionality is not there and this is the point where we create the systems for. Of course availability seems easy in that perspective but imagine you own a server. A server means other people would like to connect to that server and they would like to do it 24-7. Sure enough you can leave the computer running, you can go for a walk and the computer is still running but every now and then you'd like to, to reconfigure, to update something on the computer. And then maybe you have the situation that you can not do the maintenance work without taking away the availability of other people's connecting to your server. And in this case it's an example for a planned an unavailability, which is something different than unplanned unavailability when your server is down, for example, due to a power shortage. And uh, this example also shows that it's not a one and zero decision. There's high and low availability. Uh, for example, a server that is up almost all the time, but is only down every few nights for a few minutes, is probably something different than a server that is down all the time every now and then, and you don't really know when it's there or not, not being that much reliable. So the availability here is not is not binary, low high. Low and high availabilities may differ a lot. Even low and low availability may differ. And the availability is also a, a, a very famous um, spot for attacks. There's uh, the so-called denial of service attacks, or DOS, or even distributed denial of service attacks. In server examples, for example, people are sending so many requests to a server that the server is overwhelmed with the workload and can no longer serve other requests essentially making the page that is hosted on a server, for example, if it's a web page, not available to other users. And then the availability is not there for the moment. Um, yeah. Okay, again, our Canix example. Um, the switch wants to send the lights on to the lamp, of course. The switch needs to be available. It needs to be up and running, it needs to have power, the computational uh, part of the switch, when, when it is a switch, like in our example needs to be working, the configuration should, should be uh, correct. The media the, that is connecting all parts should be available. In this example, for example, a uh, couple wires. And of course, the destination device as well needs to be available. If the lamp is out of power, then uh, it will not be able to process the incoming uh, telegram. Um, yeah. So we want all the parts to be available. The sending part, the, trans uh, the transport medium, but also the receiving part. If somebody comes along with a pair of scissors and just cuts the wire, then of course the transport medium is not available anymore and the entire communication will fail. Essentially we cannot turn on the light, the, the light. therefore the system is not available. This is just one example. You don't need to physically destroy the wire. You can also overload the wire you can just interfere the wire with, with electromagnetic interference so that the telegram is put on the wire is no longer reconstructable from the, from the receiving end. Many examples are there to attack availability. But I hope you got the, uh, you got the basic idea of, of this protection goal. 
All right, the great big, uh, the, the, the classical IT protection goals, uh, confidentiality, availability, and integrity, we've now seen what they mean. And this is what showed, what, what was uh, part of our definition of IT security. I also mentioned earlier, they are sometimes called the CIA terrain. Um, the question is, are we safe now? And this question is an easy one because we never are, and of course there is more to it. Uh, we might even never be done with the task of achieving security, but increasing security is a good idea if it helps to have a more reliable, more sustainable, more usable system. There's other things that I would like to talk about. Um, for example, authentication. I used the word before, I mentioned authenticated communication partners, for example. Um, with that we mean the act of verifying an assertion, such as, for example, the claim of identity. If I claim to be Simeon Wiedemann, then this may be good enough for this presentation here, but um, if I am at the police office and they want to, to give me a speeding ticket, they really want to make sure that uh, I am really the person that who I am, otherwise I would just mention the name of my neighbor, which maybe I don't like or something, or maybe I would come up with a just made up name and uh, the, the speeding ticket would never reach me. So we have this act of confirming the truth of an attribute. For example, they would uh, want to see my ID card. And uh, the ID card, the idea behind it is that it's not easily uh, foolable, so I cannot really come up with an ID card for some made up person because it would not look like the original one. The authentication is probably something you uh, may be familiar with because we use it on our daily life. Um, it happens every, every time, multiple times a day for each person. For example, that's what you do at your front door using your key to open your door. Basically verifies the assertion that you are the person that's rightfully able to enter the flat because the key actually just prevents you from spending a lot of time breaking the door. You just uh, show that you have the key and with the key you can easily enter. And there's, uh, there's for example, single, uh, single factor authentications like that one for or when you log into your uh, email accounts or old email accounts, you enter your username claiming your identity and then you enter your password proving that you are the one because only the, the right one is supposed to know the password, which is an example of single factor authentication. And then there's multi-factor authentication where we have multiple factors increasing the probability of you being really the one because maybe I saw you typing in your password last time so I know your password now but in a modern email inbox, for example, you could uh, most likely select multi-factor authentication and then you would not only enter the password, but then, the pa then they would send you an, a PIN number on your, on your registered phone number, which only they, the email service provider and you know, so they ask you to enter it and making sure that it's really you. And since your number is registered, and not mine, I cannot log in to your account even though I knew your password. This is an example of, of two-factor authentication. And you, course, of course, can have three or even more factors. And the factors uh, are traditionally either knowledge-based, like knowing a password, knowing a PIN, or maybe they're ownership-based factors, like you have a security token, the hardware token or a software token, like an ID card or like the little token that opens or triggers and turns on and off the alarm at, at your company. Um, um, yeah, And they can also be inherent factors like what the user is or does, like having a, f a certain unique fingerprint or a, a retina pattern, having your DNA being individual. Like we in our society also claim that our signatures are an inherent factor for authentication uh, uh, and yeah we use it for example by signing contracts but of course there's digital signatures there's uh, 
individuality in your voice. So lots of biometric identifiers apply here. Um, yeah. And why do we do authentication? We want to make sure that the person or that, that, that we want to make sure that an assertion is, 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 is verified, a claim. For example, I claim to be Mr. Simeon Wiedemann working at University of Rostock, so I claim to be the owner of the email address simeon.wiedemann at university-rostock.de. But of course, I can tell you anything, and you just have to believe me in, in, without any uh, verification. Uh, most likely, we use the to, in the end, authorize something. For example, um, you are authorized to enter your door after authenticating by providing the key. You are authorized to enter your email inbox by providing the authentication factors that you set up first. For example, a password and, for example, the PIN that has been sent to your uh, registered phone number. The authorization is the function of specifying access rights per religious to resources. resources. In, in, in computational communication, this is what happens a lot. So when you have a computer, you don't want everybody to, to be capable of logging into your computer, so typically you have a password or a fingerprint checkup or something like this. You authorize, uh, you, you authenticate towards the system in order for the system to authorize you to use it in the way you want to use it. And again, I'd like to come to the example of, of KNX, um, where we have a look at the authorized communication. But it's a little... The, the, the light switch that were, was built into the building and that was originally configured to talk to the lamp is authorized to do so, therefore the green border. And if this light switch sends a telegram that turns, uh, that's supposed to turn on the lights, of course it should turn on the lights. But if an attacker, for example, would come up with the same device and just plug it into the wall, connecting it to the, to the wire, and sends its lights on telegram, maybe this should not work. Um, I mainly use that, that examples because I had the pictures available from our building and from my colleagues. Uh, of course, you can imagine this in a more severe situation where it's not about turning on lights and uh, turning on and off lights, but for example, opening uh, main doors with, for example, fingerprint door openers or something. Then an attacker should not be capable of just somehow forging the, the, the telegram to open the door onto the communication if that device used to send that telegram is an unauthorized one. So um, the idea would be, it should be a good idea if devices talking in a communication system like a field bus, for example, like on KNX, should have to authorize, uh, uh, should have to authenticate towards the system to then be authorized for communication which unfortunately is not the case in, in basic setups of KNX. But you will, I'm sure you will learn more about this during the summer school if you not already know more about it. I know there are some great uh, workshops coming up to this. Okay, um, another thing that's also sometimes uh, uh, mentioned when talking about protection goals, IT protection goals, is non-repudiation. Um, it's more of a legal issue, for example, with contracts. Uh, and it, it, it requires authentic, uh, authenticity that we actually know about the communication partners in the communication, that they are actually the ones they claim to be. So they claim to be somebody and then they have been authentica authenticated so that, we, that it's, validated, uh, it's valid that, that what they claim. And of course we need integrity as a prerequisite as, as well as authenticity. Um, yeah, um, in the contract it totally makes sense that once two parties uh, uh, decided on a contract and they signed it, that later on none of them can say, ah, I was not part of that communication. And this is basically the idea behind the protection goal of non-repudiation. Repudiation. Non-repudiation. Yeah. Okay.
these are some of the main main words, main ideas, main concepts that um, I, would, I wanted you to think about so that you know better and in more detail what is actually meant by IT security, cyber security, and so on. Um, now I hope that I am able to motivate you why you should care, why should I care, why we should care. Because it is an important issue and uh, I hope to convince you that you think it's an important issue as well. Why should I care? If there's no confidentiality, there's no trustworthy com com communication. Imagine your sensitive email being sent to the incorrect individual. For example, the company ex uh, example we had earlier, you come up with a super idea that would increase the productivity of your company and you want to send it to your supervisor so you can have an a discussion with him and su suggest the improvement. And then, for example, your supervisor uh, uh, has an email like, this is my email address at your company's name dot com. And you just enter the email address and you send this information and then later on it turns out that the, the, competitor, the, the competitor actually has a person that owns that particular email address, maybe even deliberately put that email address in a way that you think it's your, your supervisor. If you don't uh, authenticate your communication partner, these kind of things happen. And with email, usually they, they, they happen. I can just claim to be any person. I can claim to be Professor Clemens, Clemens Chapa in email. I, I just create an email account, clemens.chap at University of Rostock, which is not the official domain of our university, dot com, for example. And other people most likely think that, ah, of course, it says here it's the professor's email address, maybe I'll send him an email. And these emails never reach the professor because I own the, 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 the inbox. There, there's nothing stopping me from it, unless, of course, you authenticate. For example, if an opener of an email inbox would need to go somewhere presenting an ID, for example, then this, this control instance could check, ah, you are not the person, you should not have that email address. But with emails, it's, it's not the case, at least with typically non-encrypted, non-signed uh, emails. Okay, um, I have probably an even more motivating aspect of why availability, if it's missing, is a big problem. Imagine you're riding your bike or you're, riding, uh, you're driving your car, and modern cars all have the ABS system, that anti-lock braking system that helps you if you have to do an emergency brake to still be capable of steering the car. If the computers on board that are actually triggering the mechanism uh, in case of an emergency, if they are not available or if they are only available five seconds later, then you will not like that idea in, in that situation where you need to do an emergency break. You most likely die instead of having a sharp break, having a breath and then relaxing and spending the rest of the day. Also with airbags. Imagine airbags in your car accident. If you have an, an, uh, if you're unfortunate and end up in an accident and it's the communication systems that trigger the airbags are not available right now, right? like exactly on spot. Maybe the airbag opens later on, but you need the airbag to open pretty much right now. Otherwise, bad luck. So without availability, systems cannot be used, but sometimes we really heavily rely on these systems. And sometimes we cannot even wait for any second attempt. And integrity, of course, without integrity, there's no reliable communication. Even if you know you're talking to the right person, and even if the communication system is available, if somehow somebody or something can, can alter the information that is sent, then you don't really know what you have been communicating. For example, um, you don't have any guarantees that the intended information is what reached the recipient, if you, let's say, you send a bank transfer to, your pay, to, to pay your rent to your landlord, usually you pay 300 bucks, and it, somebody is interfering with the communication, 
and is able to alter some part of what you sent. And it turns out that in the end, your message was altered to not sending it to your landlord, but sending it to somebody else. And not only sending 300 bucks, but quite a lot of money, then it's probably a good idea to realize, ah, yeah, I really like integrity for my kind of communications. Okay. Hopefully, this convinces you that these are goals worth pursuing. But there's more to it why we should care. Because computers in our daily life they are omnipresent. Look at the number of people connected to the internet. It raises by the minute. Look at the people, the, the number of computers per person in rich countries. I remember when we had one computer in the house. Now I personally have multiple computers. And uh, in, in rich countries, the development is more computers, more personal ones. Computers used to be huge machines. They are now, they, they, they became desktop machines, they became phones, they became watches even glasses, even pacemakers. We, we actually put them inside our bodies. The, the size of computers is, is, is a huge factor there. The position of computers, they get closer and closer to us, inside our bodies, as I mentioned already. While early on, it were rooms or even buildings just created for, for, for the computers. And imagine, uh, or another example, uh, we have a pandemic now, and now we come up with tracing apps that somehow people feel like they become society-wide forces. Maybe this is the case, maybe it's not the case, but at least there's a huge impact in our life. And this is probably not so much debatable, that this is a thing in our life now. And it's not easily uh, ignored. We more and more and more heavily rely on computers as communication systems. So we better make damn sure that they're not only shining from the outside, but work safe and secure from the inside as well. And the context of compu computational communication systems is not only bright. Communication systems involving computers often have many participants. This is cool because all around the world people can get together in the internet, for example. Or many buildings of a company can be controlled from one controlling room. Great, nice. But often, as this example also shows, they are accessed from remote. And this is handy in some part, but of course it also means the attacker doesn't need to be close by. It can be somewhere else. And these kind of systems heavily depend on complex subcomponents, hardware-based, software-based. And the more complex components are together, the more difficult it is to actually keep the overview of what's going on. Maybe there is influences of one component to another that we don't really see at the, be at the, mo at the beginning. And sometimes people set up heavily complex systems and then they work and you don't want to touch the working system so maybe they're not updated. Which essentially means they most likely possess security vulnerabilities even, even some that we already knew about, even some that we already put fixes into the world, which may not be applied to the communication systems. So I put the, 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 the symbol of this match box with one light, light up match here, because match, uh, matches of course are handy if you want to quickly make fire, but it's probably not only good to have them around, especially if there's fire around, then having a matchbox nearby may just cause the fire bigger than you want. I'm not against computers. I don't want to transport that message. I just want to say we should be aware of it. Because in an interconnected world, which is ever more connected, formerly wire-gapped systems like plants, they were not connected to the internet. They were wire-gapped as in disconnected, a separate network. They more and more become uh, connected. It's handy to put in gateways so that you can read sensors from remote, you can, you can maintain them from remote, you can control it more efficiently. There's good reasons to, to con interconnect them, but this uh, also increases the attack surface. And nowadays, there's so much information sent, like volumes of information transported in a digital way. And the more information there is, of course, the more information can be connect, uh, attacked. And um, also, we have the situation that IT components 
get intermixed with real world components that are not, not necessarily technical and we end up with cyber physical systems where no longer only technical devices are at risk if for example I turn on and off the light all the time and the light eventually goes nuts or goes broken uh, breaks then okay it's a light so you just pay money and you have another light but in these kind of systems mistakes may lead to loss of life uh, 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 there's examples of factories blowing apart due to miscommunication and um, automatic Automated systems also decrease the response times because if everything works, we want the machines to be quick. But if something goes wrong and the communication continues very, very rapidly, then this also means there's fewer time to realize that there's something wrong. And users, as is my experience, they focus on functionality. So, for example, the university builds new buildings and the construction is done and they want for example, an easy, convenient way to control the lights from remote. So they set up a KNX installation bus. But what they maybe not know is that there's a part of functionality which they are not all of us are aware of. Then this being security. If security is not a known functionality that the customer wants, it is very likely that the industry comes up with solutions that puts security not in the first line. So it's up to us to demand that we want devices that are safe and we want de devices that are secure. We have a small factory device simulating a large factory of uh, this Fisher Technic module here and you can see a workpiece that is at po placed at the beginning of the conveyor belt. A light uh, barrier detects it and transport it, transports it to the puncher where it's punched and then delivered back. Um, you can see the device being punched and in the second attempt the light barrier is crossed by the entire workpiece without uh, the light barrier sensing the workpiece causing the conveyor belt to stop. If this would not be a small Fisher Technic device but a huge factory and it would be a really really heavy workpiece then this would be a, a problem. On the right side you see the control, the Siemens control, uh, it's a Siemens logo that is used to control this Fisher Technic model. Uh, it basically looks at the inputs and you could see on the right side in the small display that two inputs have a black background color, meaning uh, the input is in one state, uh, is, is, is triggered. Uh, is, it's not triggered in that case because the light barriers are currently not uh, blocked by an element. Um, and if you would now toggle the light barrier, and this would be a video on the right side as well, then you could see the device recognizing the change of the input state. And of course you can program uh, output states depending on input states. Um, yeah, uh, I showed you this example because I wanted to demonstrate that if you can uh, control communication and for example delay the sensor that's sensing for the workpiece or delay the transportation of the telegram that's sensing a workpiece to, from the light barrier to the controller that stops the engine then you have control of the process and you can possibly do harmful things and uh, get a factory out of order and cause huge damage or, for example. Okay, um, I promised you to have a very few words said about uh, strategies to achieve IT security, but more to this point will come uh, from Professor Chap in the, in the second uh, talk today. Um, very basic things, I hope, I hope most of you have heard these kind of words before. There's encryption, of course. We encrypt our messages, uh, so that it's more private, uh, that not everybody can read them. With encryption, there's many details we can talk about. There's content that we can encrypt and metadata we currently do not encrypt. We most likely have, probables, uh, have problems to come up with good ideas to encrypt metadata. We have symmetric encryption, 
uh, where the mechanism to come from a plain text to an encryption is exactly the same as on the other on, on the other way around. You have the same key, you apply the same same key uh, to 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 encrypt and to decrypt the message. But there's also asymmetric encryption, which allows me to uh, keep a private key, for example, and have a public key that you can shout out to the world and everybody can have this public key because this public key is only available uh, to, to decrypt your message that you encrypted but they cannot encrypt messages in your name for example. Since quantum computers become more relevant we need to make sure that encryption is safe even for the quantum age and there's something called the Kirchhoff's principle which means if you have an encryption mechanism it should not depend on keeping the mechanism secret. It should only depend on keeping the key secret. Um, to have a proper key management is another difficult thing. If you have very small devices, low computational power, low, low power resources, then handling keys may be difficult as well. Power consumption might also be a problem. You don't want a device to train the power quickly because it was encrypting and after two minutes it cannot communicate anymore because there's no power left. We mentioned authentication. I also mentioned single uh, versus multi-factor authentication, which of course is a tool to achieve security, uh, IT security. We have error detection, error correction. We can use checksums to make sure that un, uh, that that uh, altered information can be noticed, and we can come up with multiple communication paths. For example, redundant, redundant, redundant. Uh, communication uh, media so that if some system is not available the next system kicks in. This is what we do in space flight for example. And there's also helpful principles uh, if uh, you come up with products and you want these products to be secure then be aware that uh, security is a relevant part at all phases. Specification of your product, designing it, implementing it, and even if you implemented it, even if you sold it, there's still maintenance that needs to be done in order to keep up to date with security. There's, there's mechanisms that, seems to, that seem to be helpful to increase security. For example, privacy by default, only collecting these kind of information that you need for your service will prevent you from attacking from, from attacks that, uh, that uh, obtain information that you collected but you never needed. Or there's also guidelines, certifications, ESOs like 27001 uh, that uh, companies uh, are aiming for in order to prove that they do care about their security. You can do test-driven development, you can do penetration tests and security audits. And there will be a, a talk from Alexander Gladrich. Uh, 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 he works at T-Systems, which is a company uh, that does penetration tests for other companies. So uh, I'm sure he, he will talk about this uh, again uh, in more detail. And there's also the idea of uh, you as a company offering bug bounties. So if somebody finds a flaw in your system, then you offer them something they want. For example, monetary rewards in order for them to tell you what it is so that you can fix it. And altogether, risk is something that needs management. And what companies do is they manage risk by calculating the probability of occurrence for a certain threat scenario multiplied by the amount of estimated damage. And if it's very, 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 very unlikely that an asteroid hits Earth, the amount of damage would be really large. Your company would burn down. You will probably do not spend a lot of money, time or effort into preventing that risk because this is a risk you take. It's so very unlikely. But if it's something very likely, for example, I don't know, that some the hard disk will be corrupted and the amount of damages your entire customer data, your entire business case goes nuts when the disk is broken, then you will probably spend a lot of time, money, effort to come up with systems like redundancy, backups, for example, to avoid that risk or to manage that risk. So some risks should be taken, others should be avoided. And uh, 
in the, at this level it's often a question are uh, are decision makers willing to spend money or resources for extra functionality which is security and of course be aware of fence post security if you are scared of somebody reading your emails and you encrypt the emails and then you encrypt the emails uh, again and more sophisticated a super highly complex algorithm and you sit on your desk and then you need to go to the toilet and you do not lock your computer or you always leave your computer on when you go home then maybe you are super safe on one part but if there's a huge fence on one on the field and at the edge the fence just stops even if the fence is really really high people just walk around the fence they don't take the most effort way they take the least effort way and if your company is big enough something will happen eventually and then you need a good incident response plan because then probably people will, are nervous so to sum up a little recapitulation communication we said it is basically the idea of transport of information the next thing was digital communication systems are ubiquitous they are everywhere they are all sorts of shapes all parts of our life and computers use protocols to define their communication and they communicate with humans and they communicate with machines and IT security we defined as confidentiality, confidentiality integrity and availability um, yeah and of course there are strategies there are tools to deal with it for example seeing risk as something that is a product of prob probability uh, times damage so we are not left out uh, without doing something we have opportunities to do something about it and this is um, what I tried to to show you today I um, hope you liked that uh, I hope it was valuable for you if you want more I put some put down some recommendations for example the TED talk on the security marriage by uh, um, Bruce Schneier um, or a very interesting talk about uh, gateways that were actually used in, in, in industrial control gateways so they did a penetration test and showed some bugs and vulnerabilities in there a very very interesting talk is Spiegel Mining reverse engineering from Spiegel Online it's a German newspaper uh, online online newspaper and uh, there was some data engineer that paid a great detail into um, paid a great look into the details of when were articles published who published them at which time and he does a great job at, at, at teaching you and explaining you why there's so many details of information that you are not even aware of when giving them away uh, I highly recommend it um, yeah, some more things to read if you're interested. And I'd like to end with this uh, quote of Bruce Schneier. He's uh, an expert on cyber, uh, uh, on cryptography and computer security. Um, he, he said once, if you think technology can solve your security problems, then you don't understand the problems. And also you don't understand the technology. Because doesn't an anti-blockage system, an ABS, make your car safer than ever? Yeah, maybe, but if there's somebody really evil and he's interfering with your system, then you probably would not even want to expect that there is a system there which is not secure. And that should be the end of the presentation, which gives us a little bit more time for discussion later on. So don't, uh, don't hesitate to uh, ask if you have any questions. Um, Switch on your mics now, get ready for the live discussion. I hope you join in. Thank you very much.